Greetings, beloved. I am Antoinette Bolden. Thank you for tuning in to God's Truth and Deliverance broadcast with Brother Hawk Bolden and I. We pray that during this message, the Holy Spirit will open up God's truth to you and you will receive deliverance in every area of your life. For the word declares in John 8 and 32, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So stay tuned and be blessed by today's message. We want to thank God for being here today and for the words of encouragement that we've heard thus far and uh, just for the Lord uh, extending that to us to remind us of his grace and his mercy towards us and it's important that we always remember that we serve a God of, of uh, love and that love is what motivates him and everything that he does whatever it may be even when he allow calamities and things like that love is always the motivating factor and it's one of the things that we have to uh, understand about God. A lot of times, uh, people never grow up out of this mindset of what love truly is. You know, a child, when you, when you spank a child, uh, they're not relating <laughs> that spanking that they're getting to love because they don't understand, you know, a lot of times they don't understand that this spanking is ultimately to keep me uh, in line and ultimately to keep me uh, to help me to grow up, so to speak, and not make bad decisions and choices. And to understand that when I do make bad decisions and, and choices, that there's, uh, there's going to be some pain associated with that. There's going to be some heartbreak associated with that. And so while you're spanking a child, they don't understand that. It's hard for them to grasp that idea that that is, is uh, t uh, in line with love, you see. And so God, whatever he does, even when he's chastising us, it's in love. It's Amen. ultimately, as we've stated before, God wants people to be saved. And he cares more about us being saved than he does about us being what we consider blessed, mm -hmm. you see. Salvation is, is more important to him because it's, it's not God's will that anybody uh, goes to the lake of fire. <clears throat> and so sometimes people never grow out of that. Uh, never grow out of that idea that, you know, they, they grow up associating uh, spankings. They don't associate it with love. And therefore, when they become grown and God has to chastise them, chastise them they don't associate that with love. They don't associate uh, that with, okay, what am I supposed to learn from this and what is God trying to keep me from, you see? And, and so it's in this mindset that people reject those who come. Uh, preaching the word of God without compromise because they think, well, God is love, so uh, naturally so he wants me to, to have fun. Uh, you're the best daddy and the best mom in the world when you bring your children to the fair and let them ride all kind of rides and do all of these things. But it, it's uh, mom and daddy have a split personality and something's going wrong uh, when they're putting a belt to my backside. That's, that, that doesn't add up. See, that's the mindset of a child. Well, you're fun today, you know, because we went to the fair. We, you took me to the store and bought me candy. But you don't like me tomorrow when you have to spank me for doing something wrong. And, and so, uh, unfortunately, people get grown and they still have that mindset. Mm -hmm. Well, God doesn't love me today or that's not God that the preacher is up preaching because how can a loving God allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. How can a loving God uh, allow me to go through what I'm going through? Well, uh, you know, that loving God have sent all kind of uh, warnings right. before it, you Amen. see. He sent all kind of warnings. And what happens is we ignore God until we get in trouble. Right. And then when we get in trouble, how can God allow me to go through it? That's because God is not going to come down every time you make a mistake and, and make it known to you, you know, uh, in physical form that it's wrong. He, his, he left his word here. God have left his word for us to follow, you know, and that's, that's love. Though This is our instructions that we're supposed to follow. And, and so in going along with uh, what, what we've been talking about, uh, what we began uh, a few nights ago on the spirit of Elijah, uh, that great prophet that, that we're studying now, is this idea that the prophets, uh, they come with a word from the Lord, and it's not, oftentimes it's not uh, blessings to you, 
you see. Oftentimes it's, it's something of correction. And so since we have children that grow up to be adults uh, who never understood that correction is, love is behind correction, mm -hmm. then they have a hard time believing that a prophet comes in the name of the Lord and that that God that he comes in the name of uh, actually wants to correct them. You know, that they have a hard time receiving that. And so that begins the heartache of these, these prophets of, of yesterday and today that they, they are rejected because people have a false idea of love and they have a false idea of who God truly is, you see. They are rejected because of that. And it, it's a shame that people don't understand what true love is, you see, that they don't understand what true love is. And so we're going to get into God's word. Uh, we're studying again on the spirit of Elijah. So if you have your Bibles, go to the uh, go to the 28th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And you say, well, wait a minute, uh, Brother Bolden, I thought we were studying on Elijah. But we want to look at something in, in this book. Uh, what a, a statement that Elijah made. And we think it's important that for us to understand a, a, a statement that, I'm sorry, that Jeremiah made. And we think it's important that for people to understand, you know, the, the spirit that was up on Elijah, it, uh, Jeremiah spoke about it. And for you to understand the spirit of prophets and of prophecy, it's important that you understand the whole situation. And it's a very unfortunate that many churches today uh, don't know anything about prophets, uh, are not taught that prophets are still around. You have a lot of, of preachers who are misinformed in thinking that uh, these gifts, the gifts of the office of the apostles and prophets are gone for some reason, uh, as if now in the, in the, in the uh, book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, we read that those five offices, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, are given as gifts to the body of Christ That's for right. the perfecting of the saints. Amen. Now, the saints haven't been perfected yet. Right. You see? People are still being born again and still going through the process of being perfected. And so those offices aren't going anywhere. So let me make this clear. They're not, those offices aren't going anywhere until Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. They're not going anywhere. You see? And so we've been, the church in general have been taught that the offices of the apostles and prophets have been, have been wiped out. They're gone. Now all we have is pastors and teachers and some evangelists, you see. But that's not, that's not God's word. There's not one scripture in the Bible that backs that up, you see. And so we're going to see why these prophets are still around today and what they mean to the church, you see. And, and this is one of the reasons why the church... It's so lopsided uh, and so concerned with being financially blessed and so concerned with the things of the flesh and, and carnal minded uh, is because they are being taught the wrong way. They're being taught that the prophets are gone and, you know, God is love and all he want to do is pamper you. The only reason why you're born is for him to pamper you. And, you know, that's why we have so many what I call brats in the church. Uh, when a child is under a parent that, that never spanks them, that, that never disciplines them, and never tells them what they're doing wrong, uh, they're, they're spoiled. They become spoiled. And we have a lot of spoiled grown people, 40 and 50 year old people in the church, who cannot endure sound doctrine. Amen. That's why they can't endure sound doctrine, because they never heard of it. Well, what do you mean that all lies are going to the lake of fire? Well, what do you mean all adulterers and fornicators are going? No, God is love. Well, see, if you're going to talk about that, if God is, has that kind of love that you think there would be no such thing as the lake of fire in the first place. Amen. That's right. No such thing. If God had that kind of love, like what you think, you know, love is, he never would have kicked the devil out of heaven. That's right. He'd just be right there with the devil, with Lucifer, and they trying to be friends with him. And God doesn't tolerate rebellion. You see, he doesn't tolerate rebellion. Now, let's, let's, you have to think about it in this manner. Why would God allow people to go to hell? Why would he do that? You know, we're talking about a love again, you see. True love and what it is. 
Why would that God allow people to go to hell? It's because in that day he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And he don't want the goats around the sheep. Everybody understand? In other words, God is not going to allow you to bring hell to heaven. He has some people to protect there. You see? And so you have to think about it in, in this manner. You, you may have a child uh, who you're raising to love the Lord. And, and then you, you see other children around that child just cussing and, and wanting to fight your child all the time. Are you going to let your child continue to play? With that child that's cor that, that has the potential to corrupt your child? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to continue to, you know, uh, allow that your child to play with a child who, who doesn't have the same upbringing, who doesn't believe in God, who's only, who's only into himself and wanting to just corrupt your child and do harm to your child? No. You're going to separate those two. Amen. And God is going to separate his children from the goats. That's why hell was created, for the devil and his angels and anybody that, that's following the devil. You see? That's why. So that, that God that you say, I, I don't believe that he will allow people to go to hell because he is love. That same God says, but I will allow it for the purpose of, of, of uh, separating and, and keeping my children safe. So that's another thing we have to point out, that everybody that's alive is not God's child. You see, right. there are even people in church that's not God's children. So we have to make that point clear. So let's look at the whole picture of what love is. At the whole picture, if you tell your child that's playing out in the front yard, don't run, go out there in the street, and, and you see him out there in the street, you're going to get his backside. Now that child might not understand that a car can, can take his life, but you understand it. And, and see, here's the thing. You don't want your child to go through that. You don't want your child to, 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 to suffer that. Now, they don't understand what that is. Maybe you were young and you got hit by a car, so you know the pain. Or you've seen accidents where, where people were hit by cars. And so you understand what can happen, but they don't understand it. Why? Because their mind can't grasp it. It hasn't happened to them. All they know is mom and dad is trying to keep me out of the street from having fun. But see, you and your wisdom as a parent, you, you, don't, you don't just take down and say, well, my child don't understand that. So I just go ahead and let them go out in the street and play. You're still a parent. And whether they understand it or not, you understand that if they'll keep growing, they'll get to the point where they'll understand. And so God doesn't back down from his word just because you don't understand love. Amen. Amen. You see? You have to look at the whole picture of it. God's not going to back down and say, well, they don't understand it, so I'll just let them go out and fornicate. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when people do those things? Other people get hurt. You're not just hurting yourself. You're hurting other people. Mm -hmm. That's you see? And so God wants us to live holy, and his love is what, what, what brings that about, even when we don't understand it. God wants us to mature. In love. So, it, and the only way we'll do that, that's the only way we'll understand his love, is if we mature and get to know him and draw closer to him. And draw closer to him, you see. And, and so we, let, okay, let's go. The 28th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zed Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and, all of, and of all the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, we, we, we just want to give you a, a, an overall picture of what's going on here, okay? Uh, Isaiah was a prophet before Jeremiah. Isaiah's message to the people were, come back to God, and if you don't come back to God, God is going to send judgment upon this house. I'm talking about of Israel, the nation of Israel. Come back to God. And the people, they got more bold because they hated Isaiah's message. It's just like any rebellious child. You can tell a child, don't do this. Now, we're talking about, let's just going up to teenagers now. You can tell a teenager, don't do it. Don't. 
Don't uh, cut yourself with the knife. And don't put your hand on the stove. And what they're going to do? They're going to do it. Just even if it hurt themselves, they're going to do it just to be rebellious and to prove and to show you, you see. And so as Isaiah was prophesying when he was on the scene, telling the people to turn back to God, the people got more wicked. We're going to we already blown to God. And so that's the way it is. You see, we already are the children of God. We're Israel's children. And so we, that automatically makes us the children of God. And so we have a past to sin. And so they became more rebellious. And so then Jeremiah came on the scene and Jeremiah's ministry was a continuation of Isaiah's ministry, except Jeremiah added a step further uh, by God, uh, will, by God's will to say, now you, you're not going to be able to turn. You're not going to be able to avoid this thing that's going to take place. God have raised up a king named King uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to come and bring us all into captivity. So no matter how you repent now, in fact, as Jeremiah, there are two or three instances in this book that as Jeremiah is praying for the people, God tells him to stop praying for them. I'm not going to hear your prayer concerning them. It's already a done deal. Now, that's a bad place to be in when God says stop praying for this person or stop praying for whoever. It's already a done deal. Judgment is coming. And I'm, I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to turn, turn it from them. The judgment is coming. They've already gone too far. And so that was his ministry. And so in the previous chapter, uh, in the chapter 27, God tells Jeremiah, you tell the people uh, that I've made a yoke. And, and uh, under King Nebuchadnezzar, they're going to put their neck in that yoke. And if they will submit to him, uh, uh, I will... Uh, um, Allow them to live. But if they don't submit to him, uh, anybody that has a problem with submitting to King Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, they're going to be killed. And so that's that's the thing. Now, you imagine in this nation today, if people you imagine in this nation today, if people uh, uh, if uh, if God raised up a prophet to say that in this nation, in the United States, that that God is going to bring down judgment upon this nation and that you are you you are to submit to that nation, you see. What kind of issues would there be there with that with that prophet? You see, and so Jeremiah have 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 made that plain to the people in the 27th chapter of this book that God have raised up King Nebuchadnezzar, and I choose to give this kingdom to whom I choose, and so I'm raising him up for the purpose of spanking y'all and bringing y'all back to me. And so he says, so submit yourselves under his authority because God is the one that placed him over you all. And so when this happened, don't try to fight it. Don't try to rebel. Don't see how many horses and chariots you can get together. It's not going to work. Now, as Jeremiah is preaching this message, what do the people do? They go and form an alliance with Egypt. Everybody understand? They go and form an alliance with Egypt, thinking, well, Egypt is, is a strong nation. And if we form an alliance with them, uh, we, have a, we have a chance of whooping King Nebuchadnezzar. You see, and so then Jeremiah comes back with woe to those who trust in Egypt. In other words, now this this is this is the thing about it. This is the very nation that had y'all in captivity, uh, uh, you know, several uh, years ago. And, and y'all are turning back to them now for help. Y'all couldn't deliver yourselves out of Egypt. And now in your own rebellion. You want to go and trust in Egypt to help you to fight. My, my. <laughs> and that is what people do today. Mm -hmm. I don't want to follow God's word. Uh, we don't want to line up with God's word. So we're trusting our own flesh. Mm -hmm. That's what the United States have done. Made an alliances, made alliances with people who are the enemies of God. We are in alliance and allies with nations who put Christians in jail. You see, and yet we say that this nation is founded upon God principles. But but we're allies with people who put Christians in jail, who have Christians sitting in jail now in their countries. You see, it's a disgrace before God and we have to come back to his word. And so in the 20 in the 28th chapter, 
of uh, of Jeremiah, the second verse, it says, Thus speaketh the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, this is Hananiah, who is a son of a prophet, who calls himself a prophet. Verse 3, Within two full years will I bring again to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, and that king Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. You see? Now, in, in the 27th chapter, God spoke that they would be under the yoke of Babylon for seven years. Hmm. You see? But here, he's saying two years. Let's go ahead and keep reading here. Now, that's, that's easier to receive. You see, the flesh, flesh would receive that easily. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 4, it says, And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, said the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto, unto the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priest and in the presence of all the people, that stood in the house of the Lord. Now these are his words. Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied, to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive and Babylon from Babylon into this place. In other words, Jeremiah said, Hey, I, I hope that that happens. I pray that we don't have to serve the king of Babylon for all of those years. That we'll be able to, that God will break that yoke. That I hope that happens. Why? Because he was a part. He was going to be one of the people that was taken eventually. So he was hoping that that would happen. That was of his country. Nobody wanted to see their country in, in captivity. And so he's saying, amen, I, I hope that that happens. I really do. But let's keep reading here. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of the people, of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of, of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesied of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. In other words, what Jeremiah is saying is it is the M.O., of God's prophets, not to prophesy peace and not to prophesy blessings to people, mm -hmm. not to prophesy how much, you know, God loves you and how much he just want to bless you. Uh, those prophets, God don't have to raise up a prophet for that. You see that in his word. You see, you don't need a prophet to tell you that. The prophets of old, they prophesied famine and pestilence and war. In other words, destruction and things like that. Why did God have to raise up prophets to do that? It's because people have a hard time believing that God sends those things. Mm -hmm. In the book of Amos, the third chapter in the seventh verse, it says that the Lord God shall do nothing except he reveal it unto his servants, the prophets. In other words, all of the hurricanes that come and, and bring destruction upon land mm -hmm. and, and things like that, God, if God is behind those things, then a prophet somewhere know about it and he's warning the people. The only problem is these prophets aren't allowed in false churches to tell the people about it. After Hurricane Katrina went to New Orleans, came to New Orleans, that was a prophet that I know. And if you follow this ministry and you, you, you see him on our YouTube channel every now and then uh, speaking and, and introducing, uh, introducing me, uh, he, he told the people years before Katrina that God was going to send that, that, that hurricane and they wouldn't receive him. And he said when he showed up to the churches uh, after they fit, got wind because he was scheduled to preach in all these different churches in that area and all, along the Gulf Coast where Katrina affected the people. After the people got wind of what he was going to be speaking about, he showed up to church and the big padlock was on the door. They just canceled church just to keep him from coming in there and speaking what the Lord was saying. Mm -hmm. You see, that's because people don't want to receive those types of things. They just, it, it goes back to love and what their warped idea of love truly is. Right. You see, 
And, and so uh, the people were caught off guard because of it. You know, the people were caught off guard because of it. But God sends these things to warn us and to help us. But we don't turn when Katrina come and all these other different things happen. Let me make this clear. God is behind it. The word of God in the same book in, in, in Amos, the third chapter, he says, are there calamities in the land and, and destruction and God has not done it? You see that? And, and so people, because of their warped ideas about who God is and what love truly is, they don't receive it. And so then you had preachers getting up after Katrina came, uh, including the mayor of New Orleans at that time, saying, well, I don't believe God sent this. And so what did they do? They, do the, they did the same thing that the people did in the book of uh, in, in, in Jeremiah's day. They wouldn't make alliances. In other words, uh, the levees broke, and so we'll build them up stronger. That's, we're trusting that before we're trusting God's word, you see. That's the reason why this thing happened. We just weren't prepared for it. The levees were weak, and so the levees broke, so we'll just build them up stronger. And, and God says all the time, no matter what, you're going to have to line up with his word. Amen. What is your levee going to do about a tornado? A famine. Amen. What is your levy going to do about the gas, the high gas prices? God's got all kind of ways that he can get you. You see, wh what are your levies going to do about that? And about your weak economy and about how the devil operates in the city of New Orleans through people to kill other people. Mm -hmm. You better line up with the word of God. You know, you, you build strong levies. That's not how does that deliver you? What does that do for the rest of New Orleans? Now, make no mistake about it. God can send a hurricane that can tear down anything that you can build up. But that's the nature of people. They don't understand God. And they think that anybody that preaches God's word without compromise, oh, you, you just hate hateful and, and, and things like that. And so Jeremiah, he was called to speak God's word plainly. We thank you again for tuning in to God's Truth and Deliverance broadcast. Prayerfully, this message has better equipped you for your spiritual journey. To request your free copy of this message in its entirety, or if you would like to submit a prayer request, you may write to God's Truth and Deliverance, Post Office Box 23504, Nashville, Tennessee 37202. Or you may submit your request by calling and leaving a message at 615-530-6138. Tune in next week, same station, same time, for more of God's truth and deliverance. Be blessed.